Welcome to Show Studio. It's the Couture Shows, and we're going to be talking about the Maison Margiela Couture Show, obviously designed by John Galliano. Um, I've got a great set of panellists with me from all different sides of the industry, which is very interesting. And we have some designers as well, which is brilliant, because I think that Galliano is such a designer's designer. He's someone that lots of people who have their own labels or their own brands or who work for other houses constantly look to. And he's one of those people that I think inspired a lot of people to get into fashion in the first place. Um, so hopefully we can sort of delve into a bit of that and, and talk a little bit. Now he's hit his stride with his collections for Margiela about how the aesthetic there is developing. Um, but before we jump into our discussions, I will let my fabulous set of panellists introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Paul uh, Gotteson, I'm a designer. I'm Anna Trevelyan, I'm a stylist. I'm Edward Meadham, I make clothes. Um, my name's Amy Delahaye, I'm a dress historian and curator. I'm Nick Knight, I'm the director of Show Studio. I'm so serious, you're being so ridiculous before the panel starts. No, <laughs> very <laughs> sensible. Um, so Nick, I'm interested to go to you first because you obviously worked with John Galliano yeah. for a really long time. Yeah. How would you, because a lot of the reviews and the commentary around his work at Margiela has talked about how he's sort of reinterpreting the Margiela agenda while also bringing in his aesthetic. And I'm interested, what do you see his aesthetic as being as someone who worked with him for a long time? Well, I think, first of all, he was very um, courteous and he was very um, considerate to the house. When he first went there, I think he made every effort to sort of accommodate, not accommodate, but to do a good job of taking it forward. So obviously Martin had gone and left it in his hands. Mm. I was very impressed with his sort of care that he took with the house. And I think he's only allowing himself bit by bit to add new things to it. I don't think he's rushed there to change it. Mm. If you look at other designers that have gone to big houses with big names and big reputations, they say, right, out of all that and we'll bring in all. And he certainly hasn't done that. Mm. He's certainly been very careful to keep the sort of DNA of the house. Mm. I think every collection he adds a little new thing to it. Mm. So I think it's an interesting progression of it becoming a bit more John Galliano, a little bit less mm. the original Martin Margiela. But there was certainly, I don't believe there was any conflict at all. You know, I think they both spoke. Um, and it was really handed over with a great amount of affection. So I think he took that on and he's got a great amount of affection for the house. Mm. It, you know, it's the second house he's had of somebody else's, because of course before he was at Christian Dior. Yeah. So again, he took the values of that house. I think he was a little bit more brutal when he took on Christian Dior, because also the house had gone into decline. You know, Christian Dior had not been there for many, many years. And by the time John got to it in, what, 97? Um, it was pretty much sold off as franchises and all around the world. And the only place you really saw Christian Dior at the time was kind of duty-free lounges. So he took over a kind of house that was in a, in a mess in a way. And the climate of the time was slightly more bombastic, wasn't it? So it was easier to be a bit more showy and punchy, whereas now I think that agenda would feel maybe mis yeah. out of step with the tone. So other designers have been more bombastic with their takeovers yeah. of houses. Yeah, that's very true. I think sometimes they're asked to do that. <laughs> you know, they're asked to go in and not just rehash, but to sort of revamp and, and just do a whole new sort of mm -hmm. clean sweep. Uh, but that certainly I don't think was the brief that John got going to Marjola. What's your take on it, Edward? Are you a big Galliano fan? Mm, um, never massively, massively, but he's done, obviously, some very amazing things in all those years. And, yeah, I mean, I can see that he, it looks like he tried to be respectful to the uh, old house. Mm. And I think probably, I think by now he can probably stop being, and just, it, it's not that anymore. And, we all know it, it's fine. Mm. And I think it would be nice to see, it, see how it progresses to be however he wants it to be. Are you a, are you a Margiela fan? Also, not massively. <laughs> like, um, but I, I'm, I mean, I'm not really a huge fan of one specific thing ever. I, I, I've always liked different things from different periods. And the, so there's not, um, anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, they both kind of separately did um, some quite amazing and revolutionary and kind of really beautiful things. Um, and I guess it seemed relatively illogical to put someone like Galliano in such a quiet house as Margiela mm -hmm. initially, um, because like he was, it, it became the least quiet thing possible, and so yeah. massively out of blood, and he would do his big song and dance bows at the end of the shows, like compared to. Uh, Martin, who I guess no one ever saw. Anonymous. Um, so it seemed kind of random at the beginning, um, but it, I think it's beginning to make more sense visually, and I think it, I think we can all get over the the history of of a house and let it evolve into a, to where where it's going to go. Really, it's interesting because to hear you say that 
you know, he's someone who you were interested in aspects of his work because I think particularly when you were showing with Benjamin Ketchoff as medium Ketchoff, people would always make comparisons to the work of, of Galliano. And I feel like, why do you think that was? Do you think it's just that there's, if you do something that is kind of vaguely historical and maximalist, that people just make that comparison? I guess so. And I guess that when I was doing that, then no one else was really doing shows that were more performative or that even had sets at that point. Everything had gone so incredibly minimal. Um, it really wasn't my point. It was only really, I mean, I first learned about Galliano in like, I guess the early nineties because he made costumes for a Kylie tour. Um, and I was obsessed with her. And so I kind of looked at it a bit progressively through since then. That's when I started looking at fashion as well, really. Um, but that was not really what I was trying to recreate. And it was only at the end of Medium Kirchhoff, after we did that awful LVMH um, prize situation, where I was faced with my irrelevance. And I came home and um, I made the mistake of sitting and watching all of his shows. And it, I was very depressed. Uh, I, it made everything I'd ever done look like primary school play. Um, <laughs> That's not true at all, your shows were amazing. Well, no. um, but they weren't as, they, I mean, yeah. I didn't have everything he had to do it, so, but that really, I wasn't trying to recreate that. And I can see kind of why, and, and obviously I, I assume he, we would share various interests and tastes. Yeah. And I like old things, I like things to look like paintings, I love an old 30s slip, you know. Um, <laughs> We need to do like a fashion matchmaking session and get you together <laughs> to talk about clips and stuff. Um, are you a, which, which camp are you? Are you more of a Margiela person or more of a uh, Galliano I mean, person? I would say uh, definitely Margiela, I guess. Um, yeah. And I think what he did is, it was like always kind of an exercise in something like that weird little doll collection that was like blown up. It was kind of exercise in proportions. Yeah. And that I kind of, uh, I guess, missed uh, when, it also before when he kind of left and then Galliano came. Uh, mm. Yeah. I think. Why is Margiela like, it's such a mood of the time, like all the kind of it brands at the moment are like aping Margiela or will have a link to Margiela. And I just wonder why it's so, I mean, there is this kind of nostalgia for the 90s, I think, in fashion at the moment, but it's mm. interesting that so many of the young brands it's this kind of deconstructed, lots of denim, lots of, I, I wonder why that is. Like, I don't know, have you noticed that, Anna? What do you think? I wonder if it's like a relation to music as well. Because mm. yeah. obviously rap, I don't know, maybe it's because that's what I'm around, but I feel like rap is so huge at the moment. And then Margiela is like a brand that a lot of those guys are Indeed. really interested in. So I don't know if that's any correlation. That's interesting. That, but I feel like music and fashion at the moment are quite, well, always quite mm -hmm. interlinked. Mm. Mm. Do with that. It's an interesting theory. What do you think about it all? I don't know. I was just thinking about like nostalgia now and stuff. And I think personally, that's kind of have, has some somehow like negative connotations, but then actually not really, maybe. So, but I think kind of based on like my feelings for nostalgia, I kind of have sort of not really looked at Galliano because I feel it's too nostalgic or too... Yeah, or you have an escape. Ed moment where you'll yeah. be like... Oh. Yeah, it's too... Yeah, like, don't do it's it, good. it's not a good idea. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe that's like, uh, it's kind of um, not very deep analyze of it. Uh, yeah. So I feel like... There's layers to it, for sure. Mm. Go ahead. I feel like, um, yeah, that it is very... Margiela and that kind of vibe is very, very, very now with like young kind of trendy kids, but then the younger, even like trendier kids are very obsessed with like Galliano mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. like do, like 2000s Dior Galliano. They all want to trot around with J'adore Dior t-shirts and those saddle bags. Oh, yeah. They seem to be, it seems to be a weird mix of uh, mm. the, the younger generations kind of opposite. It's thing. those cycles, isn't mm -hmm. it? Of what you, it comes in waves. It does totally. It's going to react soon because there's been so much like minimalist and Head back stuff, so yeah. it has to. Mm. Here, and it's across I design and imagery <laughs> and everything, isn't it? Everything is so stripped back. Yeah. So. Mm. What's your take on all of it, Amy? Are you a big fan of Galliano? I, I imagine as a curator and someone who knows so much about the history of dress, he's a fascinating designer purely for the way he p pulls and picks from different periods. I think certainly at the point of, in time, because I mean, I suppose I'm fascinated hearing about how, you know, maybe 20 year olds are looking at. 
Galliano and Margiela because I think I'm looking at it, them as you know contemporaries in a way. Mm. <clears throat> the thing that really struck me about Galliano was I've never been that interested in menswear, but when I got my job at the V&A in 1990, 91, um, I went down to the store with the keys, which was the most incredible um, opportunity. And I looked at Galliano's menswear and I'd never been that interested in menswear. And I just thought this man is the most extraordinary cutter mm. and tailor, mm. um, you know, drawing on historical style, but completely modern. Mm. And from that point, yeah, I mean, I'm interested. He's like a product of an English art school education with cultural studies and all those sort of diverse references you get. But actually, yeah, he's he's a visionary in many ways, but actually he's really good as a hands-on, really skillful tailor. Mm. And yeah, maybe his menswear's a bit overlooked as well or been forgotten. I think it's interesting even just talk about skill for cutting because we've talked a lot about surface and I think that's what a lot of people think about. They think of the sort of the costumey like nature of some of that fashion and the finishes, but it's interesting to bring back that side. Mm. Um, Nick, you have a scoop on the show, don't you? Because <laughs> yes, I guess I do. Um, Can you tell us a bit about when we prepare for these panels. I ring up the designers. We write to designers. And say, Please, could you send us information? Please, could you send us anything about the show? Because trying to look at a show and analyse it without any show notes or without knowing what you're doing is quite hard. Um, and I remember very much actually. It's one of the sort of basic things of show studio is when I used to work with John, because I worked with John for about 10 years when he was at Dior when he first started the way through, um, and he would sit down with me before I shot the collection. He'd sit down next to the video of the show and just talk me through it. And hearing John talk about the collection he'd just made was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is what the world needs, hence Show Studio was born. Mm -hmm. Not exactly that, but a little bit that way. But mm -hmm. to explain the process, to explain the thought, to explain the reason. Because otherwise you see these dresses, and yes, they are amazing, but without any knowledge of them. It's a bit like walking around an art gallery without an art critic mm -hmm. where anybody knows about the paintings and saying, well, it kind of looks good, but I've got no idea about it. So, but I think to actually have some information. So as I say, we always phone people up and say to them, please do send us information through so our panel can be a bit more informed when they look at your collection. And John is very good at doing that. He's very good at sending through um, uh, ideas and references. I spoke to him yesterday morning. I said to him, John, we're doing a panel tomorrow afternoon. What can you tell me? And he said, well, it all starts really for me with a sort of research, a sort of looking into glamour. What is glamour now? He wasn't particularly keen on finding the answer, but he was interested in the research part of it. So he looked at different things of glamour. He said, okay, well, what, what are our sort of cliches of glamour? You know, is it a sort of uh, the back of a stiletto heel? Is it a red nail on a toe? Is it a kind of back, back of a dress? You know, what are the sort of, you know, the, the sort of tropes? He said, not to reproduce them, but almost maybe just to ignore them, to identify them and ignore them. So that was part of his process. And he talked about other things. He said, okay, lots of different things are glamorous. So, you know, intellect is glamorous. Humour is glamorous. So looking at different forms of it. He talked about um, Irving Penn's pictures of different... Uh, different tribes and said, well, you know, they are glamorous. Uh, why are they glamorous? And he was talking to me about one story, which I hope I can repeat. Um, but anyway, he's saying, you know, that in a way this collection comes from me, the idea that a coat is a very glamorous thing. It's what we put on. It's a sort of our outer layer. And he said, I was in the South France once and um, well, I was staying there for a holiday. My boyfriend wanted me to walk dogs. I don't normally walk the dogs. I was in the shower, but he insisted. So I got out of the shower. I threw on a trench coat. I got a leather belt and wrapped it around, him, wrapped it around myself. And I felt totally glamorous. And I felt that that state of glamour, I could talk to anybody I met in the street or whatever. And so that was the basis, I think, for the collection. And if you look at the collection, even up to you know, what it did with the hair, which is sort of white in the hair, as if they'd just left the shower, the shower. just come out of the bath. So it's that sort of thing. So that was the sort of basis of it. It was a sort of research into glamour and looking at glamour. And which I feel like has been his kind of thing the whole way through Margiela. Like, you know, the first collection. Oh, well, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I interrupt you, but what he said to me yesterday was he thought it was a new strand of DNA in the house. Yeah. Speaking to Ed earlier on before we came up to do our... To, to do this, and you say, well, actually, that's not quite true, Nick, because you know, there are other instances of glamour throughout the DNA of Margiela. But did John yeah. think he was bringing something new that he perhaps hadn't brought in before? Yeah. No, I think so. I think there was this show like a year or so ago where he talked about glamour, but in a different way. And I think it's, in, I think it's what you were saying. It's like building blocks. Like he like puts these little bits in and then... Because yeah. if you said Margiela, you would never say glamour would you but then actually that's weird because there were bits of Margiela that were quite opulent almost and were quite glamorous yeah. I mean what's glamour to you Ed? Oh it's lots of things um oh fucking <laughs> I don't even know how to time. <laughs> Food a friend. Good answer. Um, 
<laughs> we can take no, off I'm, you if you want. Yeah, can you? Yeah, of course. I, my, I, can't even I like your vintage look. I don't. <laughs> I dropped my phone in the Louvre, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, what's glamour to me? Um, oh, a lot of things. I, I think I've spent most of my life thinking about glamour in a way. Obviously, I like glitter and I love like, diamonds and shiny things and fur and all the obvious things, I suppose, in many yeah. ways. Um, but I guess, like, a glamorous, it's just, it, 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 um, a glamorous person is very, it just comes from what they are. It doesn't yeah. mean that you have to be glittery and... So it's intangible as well as it, it tangible. Kind of like, when, if you're saying that he, he was in, interested in the, the tri, uh, having pen tribe pictures, I mean, I've always thought that um, tribal people are very glamorous, because when they've got their ceremonial things, it kind of is glamorous. It's like they're dressed up and presenting this image, I guess, that's symbolic and intended to be powerful as well. Um, but it's glamorous to our eyes. Well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah. Well, it's, often it's feathers. So, um. It's like exotic, though, isn't it? I think it's that thing, you use the word intangible, and I think glamour is often something that feels unachievable in some way, whether because it's so different to you, or whether it's because it's similar but you can't access it. Do you know what I mean? I think that It's like elegance, isn't it? It's different, but it's... It's not unlike elegance, which is hard to define. Yeah. But I was thinking when you were saying about the trench coat, it's like a Garbo-esque kind of moment, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Putting on the trench coat. Well, yeah, and you can just imagine him sort of like having it a bit like this and a bit like this yeah. and sort of sweeping <laughs> out the house with it. So yeah. it's, exactly. a, it's sort of an attitude and a... And, a and it's how it makes you feel. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting because I was thinking a little bit about like, you know, we talked about fashion changing and I think in the last few years, like there is like there has been a slight return to glamour. Like if you look at what's happening with Alessandro Michele at Gucci and what have you, like think maximalism was so out for so long and now it's kind of back in. And I think that's interesting that how that will continue and if we're gonna go back to glamour after all these years of I mean, you guys you're both very maximalist in the work that you do and you must feel quite vindicated in a way where you're like, oh finally everyone's <laughs> doing something. Well, I feel like it, we've got this sort of um, bipolar situation where, yeah, there is some things that are super... And then you've got everything else that looks like junky kids in hoodies. Mm -hmm. well, it was interesting. I loved what um, Balenciaga did last season and they had like the huge, big dresses. Yeah. Which was a new step towards glamour for them. It was, it was still minimal and in their world, but I thought maybe that's an interesting progression into glamour. And, I wondered if everyone was going to kind of latch onto that as well because that's what everyone is latching onto at the moment. Yeah, but that's interesting. Yeah, ways to do things in a quieter way. Yeah, it I felt quite new to me. I thought yeah, it was beautiful. I was just say something John also mentioned was magic. He yeah. said in the derivation, derivation of the, the original word is glamour, which is some sort of is some mention of the occult and defining the world or where it came from. Yeah. And I said, oh, do you mean witchcraft and things that are dark?" He said, "No, no, I don't mean that at all. I mean magic. I mean the idea of illusion." So there's a little bit of that sort of going into the collection as well. But it's what Amy and Ed are saying, isn't it? It's this idea of something that you yeah. can't quite put your finger, like yeah. it's something special and you know, you can't work out why it, that's kind of what fashion is though, isn't it? It's like it has to have that feeling of like. Undefinable. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or something aspirational. Yeah. I really think of it in terms of period as well. So I think if you think of glamour, I just think of the 1930s. Yeah. And it's Hollywood and it's spellbinding and it's the beginning of animated films and, um, and yeah, and using lots of shiny surfaces. And so I think, yeah, my perception it is really entwined with period. Which is interesting when you said Hollywood, because whenever I think of the work of John Galliano, I always think of Hollywood because of so many of those Hollywood type collections that he did. Yeah, me too. And the boots in that collection are like rhinestone cowboy boots yeah. almost without the rhinestones. Should we have a look at the collection properly? And um, the gold's an important part of it, just to get you from John's. You're like, I just little yeah. bits come back to me. But he said, if you ask a child what's, what a, what's a glamorous colour, they'll say gold. And, and look at Ed, you, exactly. like, you were born for this set. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's interesting what you're talking about with the trench coat, because you see that more and more and more with the, like, with the trench and the hair, like that story you were saying, about him jumping out of the shower. What do we make of the collection? I love it. You really like it? Yeah, Why? I, it. I think it's beautiful. Well, for me, I love just seeing his like maximalist nature coming out, and I feel like it's coming out more and more every season. So I'm obsessed with like that giant cardboard-inspired trench coat that's mm. pleated. I think you're saying it's probably organza. Mm -hmm. It's like that's incredible to me, and I love the hair and makeup, and I feel like every season it's just getting more and more back to 
what I loved about Galliano. And for me, like with him, it's not even always each piece that I'm so obsessive, but I just love his whole imagination and the way it comes together. Like when you dissect it, I'm probably slightly less interested in it piece by piece, but as a whole, it's I think beautiful. I'm the opposite. Really? I think I'm much, as a overall look and look, I, I can take or leave it, but I think it's when I look at them in detail and you can see the, the construction, uh, that's what, it's quite amazing, mm. but I think it comes, it's, I think they'd be much more amazing in real life than Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. I think there's lots of layers to them. Like Nick mm. was saying that he was thinking about all these different things that are glamorous, like certain sports. So he was thinking about like skiing. Like, correct me if any of this is wrong. Mm -hmm. So there's some of the coats have like little snowflakes on them, and then the, sort of the blue colour, the blue and white. He was looking at Picasso's dove. So I think like not only in the construction, but also in like the layers of meaning, you would look at a garment and be like, mm. why is there this snowflake? I find that quite interesting. <laughs> the other thing he was saying is that um, three days before the show, they lost the venue. So the venue they had booked kind of suddenly went. And so he said, what I thought I'd do is I'd invite every, everybody to my atelier. I'd put yeah. a white runway through the middle of my atelier. I'd leave all my drawings, all my references, yeah. all the sort of half-finished things all around, and just invite people to that. And he thought that in some way that was also glamorous. Yeah. He just left the room and then walks the girl. Yeah. That access and that process, which goes back to what I was first talking about, yeah. the sort of glamour in that. This is like the season of everyone losing their venues. Dries Van Noten had the same thing. He did his in like a car park. Yeah. in the old offices of um, a prison newspaper, Liberation, Liberation? I don't know how you pronounce that in a French accent. And it was the same, everyone was like, oh my God, this venue's amazing. Because you were literally sat in these really weird little offices within this car park. And then he was like, oh yeah, my venue fell through, so we just had to do it here. <laughs> but it was great. It was really good. Like, I, think it I feel fun. like this looks like, it looks more logical than the venues that they've had um, before that looked so white and sterile and I think that helped me not understand what I was looking at with mm. in this context and then it must be weird for him after having like those venues those sets built in those venues and those mm. shows that were like little films to then showing in this big brightly lit white box mm. it, it just seemed too clean and um, sterile this obviously it's still white but it, it just seems a bit more soulful somehow I just said mm. soulful but um, and I think it's probably really nice to have the bits and bobs uh, behind the people so they can actually see like things closer. But do you not think it's quite a margellery idea to have like one item that you're like unpicking and unpicking and unpicking mm -hmm. in quite a... Yeah. That's what I find quite interesting is that like really mm -hmm. this show is just about the trench mm -hmm. pretty much mm -hmm. and all the different ways that you can oh. unpick and deconstruct and use mm -hmm. that. Are you a fan of what you're seeing? Um, I mean, it's growing on me, this show especially, but I don't know, like, I think um, what I do love about Margiela and like speaking about glamour and stuff, like there, it was incredibly sexual and even perverse as mm. well. And I think this is um, more, it's like a different, uh, different type of uh, sexuality. And it's more camp. It's more it? camp, I guess, yeah. yeah. And um, it's just kind of like that, so I kind of, yeah. I think I agree with you. I need to kind of see, I need to see the clothes. Yeah, whenever I see after the show, and gradually more and more you see the details and close-ups, yeah. then it's quite there is amazing, mind-boggling. That's but really amazing. The so. shampoo dress, yeah. yeah. That's, I, think, that's I love this dress that Bella's in, with the cha like crystal bralette, I thought it was so beautiful. Mm. Mm. I think it's weird to have her in that show. Mm. Yeah, I was surprised by the casting to have Bella Hadid in it, but maybe if he's thinking about what is glamour today, those girls to so many girls are glamour today. So it yeah, but then he does that to her hair and puts this weird melt yeah. on her face. It's just, it's really weird for me. Yeah. I don't get it. Are you not a fan of those girls? I'm quite indifferent to them. I'm just a bit bored of seeing them. And for me, that I don't find them, that's not what I think when, is like gorgeous. Who's really gorgeous to you? God. Um, <laughs> you got a spot this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, I don't know. Um, I, I literally can't think now you ask me that question i don't know i think things that when what comes through a person is more gorgeous than how like perfectly aquiline and big no, their nose is and how big their lips are <laughs> it's a good way of putting it but do you feel like your vision of glamorous fits with john's because i feel like lots of your imagery is glamorous and it's like yes. sexy and it's kind of i'm thinking of like those dual campaigns and sure. well i worked for john yeah and so my job really was to interpret his vision 
when you work for a designer, it's to understand what's going on inside their head and to make a sort of visual vocabulary of it. Um, and I worked for John intensively for 10 years. Do you think it affects how you see? It's got to. I yeah. I don't, you can't study or learn or be in so close in somebody's mind for that long without it affecting you all the way through. And John is probably one of the greatest fashion designers ever. So to be exposed to his mind and his working, you can't help with some of that, some of those values to sort of, you know, to, to become important for you as well. Mm. So for a quarter of my working life, at least, I've been um, you know, part of John's world. So yes, it has fueled what I do. Um, my own particular version of glamour, I think it's many different things. I've never particularly decided that actually it was just about a kind of you know, Hollywood vision of glamour. Mm -hmm. I find things much more glamorous in much odder ways, personally. But when, I'm, when I'm working with a designer, I'm not expressing my particular vision, I'm expressing their vision. So my own particular take on it isn't that. But um, certainly was when I was working with John, and it was certainly a great pleasure when I working with John. Is it different shooting his clothes for Margiela as it was shooting yeah. the dual pieces? Yeah. How so? Well, partly I don't, I'm not being paid by Christian Dior to do an advertising campaign. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sort of, you know, investing myself in that way. Often I get a piece will come in an editorial. We had found that fantastic tool dress with a sort of face in it last time. Yeah. I was working with um, Katie England to do the couture for V magazine. So bits come like that and, and they're sort of a, like a dream that comes into, you know, all the other clothes is fantastic, but then this one piece arrives. It's got so much going on in it, so many different stories coming out of it. That yes, it is a sort of you know, a special moment when a, uh, a Margiela dress comes through or a Margiela by John. Yeah. Um, so it is special, but it's a very different relationship. You know, I, I didn't mean that glibly that I'm not working for Dior. You know, when we were working with John, we were trying to make this brand Dior into the most successful brand in the world. And we had a huge platform to do so. And when I'm working on an ed editorial and I get a piece of Margiela clothing, it's a very different proposal. So it's fitting more then into a stylist vision of what she or he is seeing for that collection for that time. So it's a very different relationship in yeah, its different sort of purpose. From the start. Yeah, different purpose. Amy, what are you seeing in terms of, because you mentioned the 30s before, what are you seeing in terms of the historical um, and sort of you know, era aspects of this show when you're looking at it? can't see it that clearly. <laughs> I need my glasses. Um, well, the one thing I was interested in, and I can't see it that clearly, was when you were saying about the hair was quite white. Yes. Um, it's and like it made me think too. about, yeah, like those belle poudre, those amazing fancy dress balls in like the 18th and 19th century, and the remit was that you came with powdered hair. And that's, that's glamorous too. Yeah. I'm not um, going well. I'll tell you if I can find you the pictures on my phone. I'm not um, just being rude, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, I think I'm... I am an admirer of John Galliano. I think his work is extraordinary. I think he's to, to work over so many decades is extraordinary. There's not that many designers that have done yeah. that. And to work in, you know, to do menswear and women's wear. Um, and maintain that level of creativity. Exactly. And do couture and ready to wear. I think that's one of the biggest things. Yeah, as well. and they're very different. And I mean, already here, he's, hasn't he improved their um, sales are up by about 30% or yeah. something? So. I mean, it's, it's, he's, I mean, it's, you know, it, the sales are predominantly, um, is a measure of success, isn't it? Yeah. Because people are liking what they buy. I, I would like, like you to look at the clothes in really close detail. Yeah. Having looked we'll at his clothes like in the past. Have trip try on session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or have a, like, a show and tell garment in front of us one day. That would be, we well, did that once. We did that once for yeah. the couture. It was really fun, wasn't oh, it? Really, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the we model walk in his dress to do have. Everyone. Whose dresses? We had loads. We had like Chanel, Dior. We just shot the couture for a magazine, and so we had all the clothes there. Oh. Yeah. So we, so Amanda Harlick, I think. It was really fun. I so bet. We'd walk in. The girl I do dress. that with my students with like perished Edwardian dress and things, and yeah, yeah you just see so much more. Um, I think his work's extraordinary. I think he's. I think it's very clever. It's. It, to me, it wasn't an obvious match. No. And actually. But maybe that's interesting. It's like it's really hard now to do an interesting. And who would be obvious? Yeah. yeah. Um, and do also, do you want someone who's obvious? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people turned it down, didn't? They? Well, not a lot yeah. of people, but there was that thing that apparently Raf turned it down because it's a bit of a poison chalice. Like you're never going to be massively acclaimed for it if you're too aesthetically similar to what Martin Margiela did, because you'd just be seen as like diet Martin Margiela. So I think in a way it was like the only thing they really could do was to go. Polar opposite. Yeah, in a way, I think it's actually more respectful. I was kind of confused when there were all, the, all these articles about how it wouldn't be like staying true to what Margiela is because it's like no one can really do that. Even if you're doing like a weaker aesthetic version of it, it's not, it's not the same thing. But the kind of the sort of like partial and fragmented garments and deconstructed garments. I mean, there are you can see a trajectory. Yeah, and also mm -hmm. I think appropriation of sort of commonplace or. 
unexpected things. You know, like the newspaper print is a really obvious example of that, which is like such a Galliano signature, which is actually, when you think about it, a very Mojella thing to do. Um, it was a Scaparelli signature in the 1930s. <laughs> Galliano picked up on Scaparelli, that's what I think. Yeah, he uh, does get really. Absolutely. I oh, I agree. Um, that would be incredible. Yeah. yeah, that would be really amazing. Mm. Um, what? <coughs> sorry. Um, one thing that I'm just interested in also is wit, because I think one of the things that's interesting about his work is it's very, very playful, and I think fashion, it's really, really hard to be funny in fashion. I think that's one thing that he's always achieved in a really clever way, and I'm just interested to get everyone's take. Casting might be his version of wit as well. Exactly, though. yeah. And like the way he uses irony and twists and turns, like I think, I mean, you just mentioned Scaparelli and she's obviously a really interesting example of that, but I think it's quite amusing. But she's a rare example. Yeah, exactly, but like it's really hard to be funny in fashion. Like yeah. it's... I think one of the things he was saying is that, you know, a version of glamour is humour, you know, it's kind of intellect yeah. and wit and those sort of things. Yeah. And it's very knowing, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's that assurance of knowing the references and... So also, to be able to play at this level is quite rare. And I think um, part of what I love about John's collections, whether, you know, for whatever brand he's working for, but certainly here for Margiela, is they are playful. Mm. Um, and I think I love that idea of play. You know, mm. we, we seldom get to do that anymore. Normally we're working on a brief for a reason, etc. So it's far from play, mm. but uh, I think this is playful, and I think that brings a joy to it, uh, and a mischief, mischievousness to it. Um, I think they're all quite childlike things in a nice way of childlike, because yeah. children, when the mind's more unstructured, mm. um, yeah. and ideas come more easily. And I think from what I know about how John works, especially for Margela, you know, there are moments where they sort of do dress-up day. You know, where they get all the archive out and they put them all upside down and wrong way around and they mix all the things. So they just play with the clothes. Uh, because that spontaneity and that joy is something that's very hard to do if you feel the sort of weight of a huge house on your shoulders and the sales figures and everything else. But to be free of that and just to spontaneously react to different colours coming together and different forms <coughs> and shapes, I think that's very beautiful how John works. So I, I do think the collections are playful and, you know, that's at this level is hard. It's not even just the big houses, like, it's interesting like Adam Pett to get your, your opinions on this, because I think even as young, like young labels, like you must, do you feel that pressure of not being able to sort of like explore? And, and it was interesting just thinking about like the man show, because mm. there is, I think, this return to sort of like kind of unbridled mania in, in terms of like the London shows. There's a lot yeah. more where it's very, um, like particularly people like Rotting Dean Bazaar, where you're not even really sure what it is. Like, yeah. is this an exercise in just mm. like exploring that isn't more like an art thing. Yeah. And I wonder like, how much license you feel to sort of exist within that context. Well, I think in like, this day and age, it's quite like, why would you feel, like I also have the luxury being a young, young label to kind of not be so kind of careful uh, with that mm -hmm. as well. But I don't know, it doesn't seem to make sense to, to, um, to uh, like hold some type of standard that's been going for years and years and years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, I guess personally, I feel uh, I can play. I guess. Well, it's interesting to <laughs> use the word standard because yeah. I think that's really yeah. a smart word because it is the way the whole fashion system works is like young designers show and then they're put on a website next to sort of Prada yeah, as if they're I mean, Prada. It's weird. That, yeah, isn't you it? have, yeah. Yeah. Of course, you have that thing. Yeah. It's funny like how actually rigid. Yeah. Uh, system is uh, it's like things aren't seen within the context that they're in. Yeah, but I think uh, somehow it's like that thing is kind of more uh, apparent. Or like uh, in school, when you mm. are out of school, you sort you sort of uh, don't really have to care about mm. that because you, I mean, the man show and thing. I guess you have that validation anyway, mm. which helps. Uh, mm. I guess. Uh, yeah. But it's exciting yeah. to see young designers work in that yeah. way again, where you're not really yeah. sure what. It doesn't feel like it's kind of. You're not exactly sure what the purpose is, which yeah. is kind of. It's I quite mean, liberating. Yeah, it is liberating. Yeah. What's your take on all that? Because I imagine that the more you got into fashion, the harder it is to be. Well, <laughs> I never really stopped uh, experimenting with things and playing with things and just trying to make something that entertained me and um, that was pretty. Um, obviously, that didn't go that well. But I think it's probably easier, um, like when you speak about um, the kids are just starting to show there's really if they're going to sell anything it's barely anything so it's not really going to make any difference they don't really have to sustain like the sales of like Dior 
Yeah. Mm. So they may as well just do something that they like. Do you ever wish you'd operated in the sense of doing like almost like performance art or um, theatre mm -hmm. or costume? Because looking at some of the young brands now, like, I, I think it feels like that's kind of the avenue that they're going down. They're not going to ever be a brand that sells a lot of clothes. They're going to be almost like a this kind of rounded creative that one can be now. Like, yeah, mm. it does. It does seem that way. I wonder how it's going to work out for them. Uh, do I one wish that I'd sort of done that? I think I thought I was doing that in a way. Mm. So, <laughs> like, you, know. but you must feel quite vindicated now because I feel like your aesthetic is quite. You see it more and more now. Um, I don't know if I feel vindicated. Frustrated. <laughs> Only frustrated that um, I was constantly told that what I did was uncommercial. Yeah. But then I see some things that seem very similar. People talk, keep talking about how commercial they are. And I'm just like, well, why? But no, I think, you know, I mean, everybody does their things, don't they? Mm. It's a good way of putting it. So we're impressed by this collection. Has it thrown up any other conversations? Like, it is interesting to talk about glamour. I don't think we've ever actually really talked on glamour on any of the thousands and thousands of panels that we've done, which shows really? that it's... An, yeah, it's weird. It's not... I don't think it's something... Like, it doesn't feel like a... And I don't mean this as a dig about the collection, but it doesn't feel like a contemporary notion. Like, it's strange well, to talk about... quite dirty for a long time in yeah. people's ideas, and I guess people associated glamour with, like... Um, I don't know, Julia McDonald or something. I also think an yeah. antiquated version of femininity. I think it's like to call a woman glamorous, I think implies, it's like calling a woman bubbly. You know, it's yeah. like has that kind of <laughs> unpejorative. I really don't think so. Do you not? No. Um, mm. I think, I don't know, I think glamorous looks like an armour, isn't it? Mm. I mean, he wasn't saying this is a collection about glamour. Yeah. It's research into glamour. Yeah. Saying, right, so I want, don't want to propose a new glamour, I want to look into the research for new glamour. Yeah. So it's identifying things we consider glamorous and then putting them to one side as much as adopting them. Yeah. So it's a different take in that way. But that's what's interesting about the collections is they feel more like questions than propositions. Yeah. 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 And it's quite nonchalant as well, isn't it? Which I think is really appealing, just like the way it can be a really elaborate garment that is obviously really lavishly worked and then it's just seemingly tied. It's very like loose. And yeah. Mm -hmm. But I guess it is, if it goes back to him, like, getting out of the shower and throwing on a coat, like... I like the way some of the girls, their hair looks like it's shampoo, and the others, it's, like, gold. Yeah, like, yeah. I think it's... I love that. I like that it's a little more sexy. Yeah. You're seeing, like, a waistline, and you're seeing that enhancing yeah. the breasts, and the little crystals dangling off. The, I, I really love that, more feminine. There's a particularly nice yes. sweater. It's just kind of that sort of angle. So you see half of the hip on this side. It's very sexy. Hmm. And it's not easy to make knitwear sexy. No, indeed. <laughs> well, take your word for it. We're impressed then. It's given us lots to... Mm -hmm. what, what do we want to see him do next? More of the same? Do we think it's a good fit? Are we... Does it give us faith in that... Like, I mean, there's a whole conversation to be had about the purpose of couture in this day and age. And I think it's, it's really exciting to have this, like, something like this shown within the context of couture, where people seem to be so easily impressed by like a giant set and lots of music you know so you're nodding well yeah i mean the people some of the uh, big houses shows have just got uh, overblown for the sake of being overblown and yeah so then it's i think it's nice if there's like diversity in fashion and i don't mean that in terms of like models i just mean like you know it's nice that all these different people can exist so different ways of doing things. different ways of doing something so it's nice to have something so quiet i also really appreciate appreciate how small the collection is mm. yeah it's not like you're sitting through like 70 looks of like <laughs> yeah i think um, what yeah what's extraordinary as well is that it is coherent as a collection yet yeah there's a such an incredible variety in it as well so there's a coherent look but in terms of materials and techniques and silhouettes there's an awful lot of ideas in one collection, but it still holds together. I feel like it's really apparent looking at it that he, I imagine, um, is enjoying it a lot more than mm -hmm. like some of those Dior collections were so kind of hateful and spiteful in their grandiosity and <coughs> um, proportion and mm. how those girls look like they're about to kill themselves, like falling down. Um, and I think it would be nice to see him trust himself more and do what he's going to do. Mm. He's also a designer who he doesn't need to be in the limelight in many respects because the work speaks for itself. So what else do you have to prove? And exactly. Yeah. I mean, does he, would he even want to? I, don't, like, yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of amazing that he even wanted to come back 
and my collections are going after all of that, what happened. One thing that I think is really interesting, I think I mentioned this on one of the first panels we did about his Margiela collections, is um, I think it was Alex Fury, someone did an article about the appointment and they worked out how many collections he would have done if he hadn't um, lost his position at Dior and it was something like 40 or maybe even more, it was something insane. And I think that's what is so interesting about looking at this is how edited and focused it is, as you just said, when you think he must have like millions and millions of ideas, like mm. all those themes that those collections would have had and to be well, able to... I think to... you sort of like, um, um, maybe I'm speaking about myself, but I feel like when you have, you get in a, in a, a rhythm of thinking like that when you're doing it and you're creating things all the, all the time and then he stopped and maybe it's not so easy anymore and maybe he didn't have the, yeah. that, that gap full of stuff in his head maybe I don't know maybe it's like starting afresh yeah when you stopped to do the natural history museum stuff because how long was that for 18 months no yeah a year did you feel like you had but at the end you had loads of because that was kind of at the height of you doing big Dior stuff, was it? It was like real, like... No, it was a little before that. Before that? I'd worked for Yoja Moto for yeah. three years, and then Jules Sand and Martin Sidbon. And then uh, Natural History Museum asked me to do a very big project for them. Um, and it's obviously nothing to do with fashion at all. And I was having my first child at the time. So it seemed to be a different psyche for me. And I thought, well, I'll take a break from all of that. Yeah. Right to one side. But, um, but I was shooting every day for nine months solid at yeah. the Natural History Museum, so I didn't really have a break from photography. I just then a break did, you ha did you feel like you came back, kind of as we were saying with like, you know, we were saying he could have come back with all these collection ideas or quite the opposite. Did you come back with like a million collection ideas or did you feel like, not collection ideas, like editorial and shoot ideas or did you come back and feel almost like you'd started afresh? No, I think I came back, well, two things. I, I came back with lots of ideas I wanted to do because you do amass them in your head. And also I came back to a relationship with John and a relationship with Lee McQueen. Mm. So I went from you know, doing flowers and natural history museum things to working with John and Lee. So that was in a way with lots of ideas going on there in any case. Yeah. Um, but yes, it was a certain, I missed fashion in the year that I took out. Um, I did come back feeling that I missed it and I wanted to reindulge in it. For me, it's Which I guess is that. probably the same for him. It's like, you know, you're saying, like, why would we want to do it? Sometimes it's like, if it's just what you do. But it's healing as well, isn't it? I think it's, it's what you do, it's your life. Yeah, I think yeah. it is healing. It's, you, it, I can't, it's, you can't imagine if you're that passionate about you, what you do, yeah. not doing it because it's right. who you are. And I think he's always made clothes that rely in some way on interaction and a reaction so it's not like he can just go away and do it on his own and have a wonderful I think it's like he is a provocative designer in that sense of need it like creating these statements and having people respond to their collections and I think it only works in the context of that you know I can't imagine him going off and doing like a big long personal project that a very small amount of people got to see so we like it we're all feeling glamorous <laughs> Always feeling glamorous. You're always feeling glamorous. <laughs> I feel really deeply unglamorous because I have the flu. Mm -hmm. So, on that glamorous note, <laughs> should we give him a round of applause to wrap things up?